So I'm Holly Murbaum, and I represent the Purity Implementation Coalition, and we are a coalition of mental health and addiction consumer and provider organizations. And most of our groups worked together to get Purity enacted in 2008, and then we've worked together since that time on its implementation. So next slide, please. Thank you. So I think some of the things I was going to talk about, some of this hasn't been covered. Obviously, Perry Law was signed by President Bush in 2008. We keep emphasizing the date because we've kind of got caught up on a little bit in the Affordable Care Act, which we relate to. But we are, in fact, our own separate law, and we were a bipartisan bill when we were passed as part of the financial bailout package. So interim final rules were released in 2010, but they included some gray areas, which you've heard a little bit about, and I'll talk about more in a second. And so since that time, we've been pushing for a final parity rule. And the good news is that in the wake of the Newtown tragedy, the president did promise a final rule on parity, and we've since gotten um, confirmation that that should be out this year. However, of course, just the release of a rule is not sufficient. We need to make sure that it's a strong letter, a rule, and which I'm so glad to hear about the letter from Senator Baldwin. It's really important to get everyone on. That package also included Medicaid parity guidance, which had been <coughs> promised in 2010 and was not released until this year. And it also promised that there would be parity in the essential health benefit package, which was included in the final rule that was released in February. Which is all very good, but it's about making it all a reality. Next slide, please. So three of the issues which have been touched on a little bit, and I'll go into a little more detail, but I also recognize it's incredibly complicated. And so I'll try to go and make it as understandable as possible, but it's not easy. So the first one is the disclosure of the medical criteria. The law says that they have to disclose the criteria used to make medical <coughs> benefit determinations. However, getting the behavioral, I'm using behavioral to mean mental health and addiction, um, just because it's easier. Getting that criteria at all is difficult in some cases. Getting the company medical criteria, so you can do a parity compliance and see whether or not it's the same, next to impossible. <coughs> so that's the first thing that the final rule needs to clarify, that this is not optional for plans. The second one is non-quantitative treatment limits. Normally, when we say this word, people at that point decide it's a good time for a nap. <laughs> a quantitative treatment limit, and this, this term is created by the interim final rule, a quantitative treatment limit is something that's pretty easy to count. You can put into your calculator. So it would be like a copay or a deductible, a day and visit limit. You can go, okay, I've got one, two, three. A non-quantitative treatment limit is a little more insidious. So it's something, it forms of medical management, uh, provider networks, things like that, that, so utilization review, prior authorization. Those really are the ways that plans can very easily deny care as probably most of you in this room have experienced. So our argument as our Parity Coalition is that there needs to be a formula to operationalize how you actually apply this. Because the rule says you can't use non-quantitative treatment limits more stringently on your behavioral benefits than you do on your medical benefits. But there isn't a test for that. What does that mean in practice? So we argue that, for example, a plan would have to use a NQTL on 50% of their medical benefit before they could use it on their behavioral benefit. So there's some standard before you just go start applying it on everything on the behavioral side and 1% maybe of your medical benefit. Makes sense to us anyway. The final thing is, especially for eating disorders and for addiction, probably the, the issue that requires the most attention and that is scope of service. And that relates to the exclusion of residential treatment and intensive outpatient in particular. So we have seen an uptick in plans in the Government Accountability Office, so the, the source around Washington did a study and they found the same thing, even with a small sample size, that more plans were excluding residential treatment. Next slide, please. So looking around the room, I see many faces who I've seen or talked to around the country because last spring we launched the Patriots for Parity Tour with former Congressman Patrick Kennedy and former Congressman Jim Ramstad. And we had all these field hearings, and then there's one coming up in Atlantic City in June. And the purpose of them was to get the story from people on the ground, to hear from providers and consumers and other experts, even a district attorney in um, Colorado, to talk about why mental health and addiction treatment are important, how parity implementation is going in their state, and to make the case ultimately to folks back here in DC for a final rule that addresses the issues that we just talked about. And some of the barriers that we talked about earlier, 
it shouldn't have to be this hard. Over and over and over again, we heard from people saying, I have gone to war with my insurance company, and I have the resources to do that. I have no idea how someone who's in a crisis could handle the situation. It shouldn't have to be this hard. We've heard about the lack of transparency and disclosure from plans. A mom in Minnesota was trying to get her son addiction treatment. The plan said that he didn't meet the American Society of Addiction Medicine patient placement criteria. She asked them for a copy of the criteria. They said they didn't have it. She went on Amazon and bought it. <coughs> over and over again, those kind of stories. And then we're hearing about the exclusion. In Chicago, a woman named Danielle testified. She talked about how as a result of her untreated eating disorder, largely untreated, she estimated that her insurance company had paid $500,000 or so for her medical benefits. Had she been properly treated for eating disorder, the cost would obviously have been significantly less. So again, over and over, from all these stories, from obviously Kalamazoo is a little bit different than Los Angeles, and we've heard the same things again and again. Next slide, please. So what are we going to do about it? Well, the Baldwin letter is a great start. We've had several letters that have been sent from members of Congress over the last few years, and we have felt like the administration has, is hearing us. Clearly, the reference to parity and recent budget documents and the President's gun violence package are recognition that they are aware that they need to put out a rule. But just putting out a rule is not quite enough. So we need to make sure that parity violations are reported to the federal government. That means if you have a violation, sending it to the agency. And we'd be happy to give you that contact information. And, there, and the next slide is contact information for our coalition. It means knowing what a parity violation looks like in the first place. So you can identify it, you know what folks, what their rights are, and then making sure that the appropriate people hear about it. What we're concerned about is that this is happening and it's not making its way up to Washington. So when a final rule comes out, they're gonna say, here, here's your final rule. And we're gonna say, but it, it didn't fix it. So in order to fix it, they need to know what the problems are. Also, if you're congressional staff, it's important to know what people's rights are. We encourage people to contact their members of Congress. And just yesterday, I was emailing with a mom in Washington state who has been trying to get treatment for her son, she contacted her member of Congress and they referred her to the Department of Labor who has been doing some assistance. So it's important to be able to recognize what it is and then you know refer, because again, this is very complicated. And to keep us on a loop because we can sometimes help. And then it's also really important to just have a process in place for filing all these appeals, because it's very <coughs> overwhelming and it's a lot of people. So this is the, the information I mentioned. Our website is Parity is Personal. We have a toolkit on there that has um, information about what a violation looks like, what the rights are, and how to appeal it. We've gotten some good feedback on it, so hopefully it's helpful. And then there's information here for contacting the federal folks. It's made further complicated by several agencies sharing jurisdiction, but they have promised that if you approach them, they will send you to the correct office. So that means if your state has primary enforcement, make sure that they send you the right people. But you can go to anybody and they'll get you help. Next slide, please. So again, this is our um, contact information. We encourage folks, if you have a question, to reach out to us. And again, really thank you so much for coming to Washington, because only with advocacy like this have we gotten as far as we've gotten today. Thank you.